In this video tutorial, we'll be using the ICE method to solve several sample equilibrium problems. All right, in our first sample question, it's pretty straightforward. There's no real tricks to this one. Please pause the video at this point, and when you're ready to proceed, we can go through the solutions together. When solving equilibrium problems using the ICE method, uh, the first thing you need to do is to ensure that you have balanced the chemical equation because that's where your coefficients are going to come from, which are then placed into the exponents. Uh, the next step, ensure that you have converted all your mole values into moles per liter, so molar concentration. All right, so that being said, let's uh, punch in our ice chart. So we start off with 2.50 moles of chlorine trifluoride, as well as one mole of fluorine gas injected into a rigid one liter container. So everything is in moles per liter at this point. However, there is no chlorine monofluoride. Because there's no more chlorine monofluoride, it is impossible for the reaction to go reverse. You know the reaction has to go forward at this point. So if the reaction is going forward, that means that this is going to diminish by a certain amount, while this will increase by a certain amount, so plus x and plus x. Thus, at equilibrium, you'll have a 2.50 minus x, an x, and a 1 plus x value here. After filling in our ice chart, we can now write out our equilibrium expression, KQ is the concentration of the products over the reactants. And then we can start plugging in our product and reactant values into the equilibrium expression itself. Unfortunately, this is going to end up being a pretty ugly quadratic equation. Uh, so to avoid this situation altogether, we can help ourselves by simplifying the calculation, simplifying the equation using the approximation rule. So what the approximation rule states is, if x is equal to a super small number, then 2.50 minus a super small number might as well be 2.50. Same thing with 1.0 plus x, it might as well be 1.00 once you've factored in uh, your significant figures. This in turn allows us to simplify 1 plus x basically equals to 1, so we can remove the x value over here. And the 2.5 minus x is basically 2.50 and we can move the x value over here. And this equation is significantly easier to calculate. So how do we know if x is a super small number or if it's small enough to be negligible? What you're going to do is to take the initial concentration, divide it by k equilibrium, and if the value is greater than 1,000, then you know that x is at least several orders of magnitude smaller than your initial concentration and therefore negligible. And so with that, we take our simplified calculation, plug in the values, and then solve for x. Thus, our final answer is 2.19 times 10 to the power of negative 13 moles per liter of CLF to be found at equilibrium. All right, now on to question number two. Uh, as before, pause the video, and when you are ready to proceed, we can go over the solutions together. As always, the first step in solving these problems is to write out the balanced equation. After that, we then fill in the ice chart by putting in the molar concentrations of each component. So when you take a look at this one over here, notice how it says mole of hydrogen gas. When it comes to equilibrium, the measurements or the units must be in moles per liter because we're looking at molar concentrations. So two moles of hydrogen gas over half a liter equals to 4 moles per liter, while 1 mole of uh, iodine gas over a 0.5 liter container means it's going to be 2.00 moles per liter. So let's plunk them in over here into our ice chart, and this is how it will look. All right, so we got the full more 4 moles per liter of hydrogen gas, 2 moles per liter of iodine, and 0 hydrogen iodide. So because there is 0 hydrogen iodide, it is impossible for the reaction to go in the reverse direction. The reaction must go forward. That being said, if the reaction is going forward, then that means the hydrogen gas will be reduced, so the iodine gas. Meanwhile, the hydrogen iodide will be produced at a rate of 2x, because it has a 2 to 1 to 1 ratio that we got from our balanced equation. So at equilibrium, we'll have 4.00 minus x hydrogen gas, 2.00 minus x of iodine gas, and then at the uh, equilibrium, we'll have 2x worth of hydrogen iodide. We can now write in our equilibrium expression and punch in all the equilibrium values into it. 
Unfortunately, at this point, it's going to look pretty ugly. You'll notice that we cannot use the approximation rule in this example. When we take the initial concentrations and divide by KQ, the values are not greater than 1,000 for either situation, and that tells us that the X value is large enough that it's no longer negligible, that we do have to factor it in. So after expanding and simplifying our calculations, we arrive at the standard form where A is equal to 46, B is equal to negative 300, and C is equal to 400. We can plug this into the quadratic equation and arrive at an answer of X equals to 4.7 and 1.9. However, only 4, uh, I'm sorry, 1.9 makes sense because if you plugged in 4.7 as an x value, you get a negative concentration, and that, of course, does not make sense. So that means the concentration of hydrogen iodide at equilibrium is 2 times 1.9, which is 3.8 moles per liter, but the question asks for how many moles of HI are present in the end, so we need to convert our molar concentration into a mole value. Since mole is equal to concentration times volume, 3.8 moles per liter, 0.500 liters, we get an answer of 1.9 moles of hydrogen iodide will be present at equilibrium when all is said and done. All right, let's move on to something a little more challenging, question number three. Once again, pause the video. When you are ready, uh, unpause it and we'll go through the solution together. As always, the first step is to balance your chemical equation. So hopefully you placed a coefficient of 2 in front of the carbon monoxide. You'll also notice that I gave you the mass values for the reactants. Uh, whenever you're plugging these values into the ice chart, they must always be expressed in moles per liter, molar concentration. So you want to convert these into a mole, then divide them by the volume, 2.0 liters over here to get the molar concentration. Another thing you may have noticed is that uh, carbon over here is a pure solid. Pure solids and pure liquids, their concentrations do not change and as such do not affect the overall equilibrium expression. In fact, they're actually factored into the K-equilibrium constant itself. That being the case, you don't have to worry about the 24.2 grams of carbon. It is irrelevant to our calculations because we will not be factoring it into our ice chart. Alrighty, so uh, because the carbon is irrelevant, we can just ignore that 24.2 grams. However, you do need to convert your carbon dioxide mass into a mole value. So 132 grams for the mass. The molar mass is 44.01 grams per mole. We can find that from, from the periodic table. And that gives us a whopping 2.99 moles of carbon dioxide. Uh, since carbon dioxide volume is 2 liters altogether, Take the mole value, divide by the volume value, and now you get 1.499 moles per liter for your initial concentration value for the CO2. I can then take that into our ice chart. There's a chemical equation at the top. I put a line through the carbon because it's a pure solid, so I don't have to worry about any of the values over here. But I do need to worry about the 1.499 moles per liter of CO2. None of the carbon monoxide has been produced yet, so therefore the reaction must go forward. Because it's going forward, it's impossible to go reverse. This one's going to be a negative value. This is going to be a positive value. You're going to consume the CO2 while producing carbon monoxide at a rate of 1 to 2. It's a 1 to 2 ratio over here from our balance equation. And so therefore, at equilibrium, these will be your values for carbon dioxide and the carbon monoxide. We now write out our equilibrium expression, products over reactants. Don't forget the coefficient of a 2, so that should be placed into the exponent value for carbon monoxide. And you'll notice that carbon has not been factored into our reactant because it is a uh, pure solid and will not affect the calculations. So there's our equilibrium expression. Let's punch in the actual values themselves. KEQ, 1.53, 10 to the power of negative 4. Uh, 2x, punch it over here with a squared. 1.499 minus x, punch it in over to the reactant side over here. Now in this case, I'm going to use the approximation rule. Remember, avoid the quadratic equation where possible, uh, just because the more steps you take, the more mistakes you can make. And that's uh, never good for anyone. So with the approximation rule, I was able to take the initial concentration, 1.499, divide by the K equilibrium value of 1.53, 10 to the power of negative 4, and that value was greater than 1,000. So that means that X is a small enough value to be negligible in comparison to 1.499. Thus, 1.499 minus a super small number might as well be 1.499. All right, so there's the approximation rule. Let's move on ahead with our simplified equation. 
So with our simplified equation, 4x squared uh, divided by 1.499 is equal to 1.53 to the power negative 4. Solve for x, and you get an x value of 0 0.00757. Since the concentration of carbon monoxide is 2x, well, 2 times this value is 0 0.0151 moles per liter. Since the volume is 2 liters, and therefore the mole of carbon monoxide is 0 0.0303 moles, mass of carbon monoxide is mole times molar mass. There's the mole, there's the molar mass, multiply them, and you get a final value of 0 0.849 grams of carbon monoxide. All right, so it's important that you read the question carefully. Uh, some students will leave it at the concentration value of 0 0.151 moles per liter, but if you look at the original question, it asks what mass of carbon monoxide is expected to be produced at the end, and so we cannot leave it at just a uh, molar concentration value. It must be converted into a mass value in the end. All right, on to the final question in this video tutorial. Question number four. Once again, press pause when you're ready. Unpause it and we will go through the solutions together. All right, so the first uh, step is to ensure that the chemical equation is balanced. In this case, it is balanced. Then what you can do is take a look and see if the initial values given to you are done so in moles per liter. Uh, they are expressed in moles per liter, so that's fantastic. So really, at first glance, this equation, or this question rather, seems pretty straightforward. However, at closer inspection, you'll notice that every single component in the chemical reaction, it starts off with a value that's not zero. In the previous questions, it was a little easier in the sense that uh, one component was always a zero. So it made it easy for you to identify which direction equilibrium was shifting. Was it going to go forward? Was it going to re go reverse? But in this case over here, it's not as obvious uh, whether the reaction is going to go forward or reverse. So to determine which direction the reaction is moving in, we need to calculate QEQ. If you recall, QEQ and KEQ are identical calculations, uh, same equation. The only difference is that KEQ refers to the uh, ratio of products to reactants when you've reached equilibrium, when the reaction is over, if you will. Uh, however, QEQ refers to the current ratio of products to reactants. So by comparing QEQ to KEQ, we are able to determine, do we have too many products or too many reactants? And based on that information, determine which direction, forward or reverse, uh, the reaction is flowing in. Otherwise, you would not know if this was a minus x, minus x, plus x, if this was going forward. However, if the reaction was going reverse, then the values would be plus x, plus x, and a minus x instead. So that's the whole point of using QEQ and comparing it to KEQ to determine which direction are we moving in, and that of course will affect our change values, whether they're positive on the left or positive on the right. Alright, so solving for QEQ, we see that uh, the products over the reactants punch those values in, and we calculate a value of 8.75. So when we compare QEQ to KEQ, 8.75 versus 3.50, you'll notice that QEQ is greater than KEQ. And this tells me that the products of QEQ are greater than the products of KEQ, meaning I should have this much products when the reaction's over, but instead I have this many. So that means I have too many products right now, and uh, I have to go in reverse to reduce that amount. So in order to reduce the number of products, I need to go in reverse because my product concentration is too high. As such, when I go in reverse, I will reduce my product concentration to the levels that I'm looking for at KEQ. So now that we know that the reaction is going in reverse, we can complete our ice chart with a negative x value, because it's the PCL5 is being used up as we go in reverse, and positive x values for the PCL3 and chlorine, because they're being created when you're going in reverse. We then finish up with our equilibrium values over here, and then plug them into our equilibrium expression, products over reactants. Unfortunately, when we begin to solve this calculation, you will quickly realize that this is going to get ugly. Uh, and we cannot use the approximation rule because if you take a look at the initial concentration and divide it by KEQ, the value is not greater than 1,000. And that tells me that the x value over here is significant enough. I cannot uh, approximate it to zero. Uh, it's not negligible. We do have to factor it in. So sadly, once you do your calculations and put it into standard form, 
you realize you're going to have to use the quadratic equation where a is equal to the positive 3.50, oh, b is 2.4, and c is negative 0.21. Punch it into the quadratic equation, and uh, you'll find these are your final answers for the concentration of PCL5, CL2, and PCL3. However, I think the calculation or the question only asks for the concentration of CL2 at equilibrium, so the other three are not really necessary. You only need this one over here. All right. There you have it, using the ICE chart or the ICE method to solve several types of equilibrium problems.